going back to something, especially something that's like almost 20 years old, it's like opening a can of worms potentially, you know, it would like give all the angry fans, like to kind of remind them like, oh yeah, I hate that guy. I forgot that my favorite comic just stopped in the middle of an issue. When we started, Battle Chasers was not what we set out to make at all. But Battle Chasers was important because it was the playground we used to discover ourselves in the studio. One of the guys we were having lunch with said, well, you're doing a new studio and a new game. It's going to be Battle Chasers, right? Quite a few of us before Airship were at Vigil where we worked on Darksiders 1 and 2. Joe and I were two of the four founders there. And uh, I think as quite a few people know, eventually Vigil, which was a subsidiary of THQ, went down when THQ did. We started Crytek USA after that, but a lot of people that we really enjoyed working with and we really cared about had to leave. You know, there was no way, there was no way to keep 100 50 or however many people were still at Vigil at the time. Some of our best friends were leaving Austin and leaving the state. I think at that point we were sort of exposed to the, the reality of, the, of, of how the business works. Um, so then when it happened again in a way at Crytek, I don't think it was as much of, much of a shock. I had stayed in touch with those guys. Um, we were all friends. In particular, I talked to Ryan a lot and he would keep me up to date on how things are going and we always even years before that, we had always talked about how cool it would be to do something small. Because those are some of the days I think we enjoyed a lot at, at Vigil. Um, really, even though at Vigil we got really big and there was something nice to being small, even as Vigil got bigger and bigger, it still maintained that feel of a small studio. Um, but I think we wanted to go back and have a chance to, with a clean slate, focus on doing something that could keep that family feel at an actual small size. After I left, I wasn't really sure what uh, what I was gonna do like in games again. I, I mean, I, I was kind of just like doing comics for a little while while I figured it out and kind of seeing what happened with you know Crytek and um, you know where the Darksiders rights ended up and all that stuff. During that time, we were both sort of like looking for like a window. I was wrapping up my Marvel contract and and there were a lot of like indie developers with these small studios that were starting to take off and it was like wow okay you don't need a team of hundreds of people you can have a successful game with just a handful of guys and and so we talked about how cool that would be and we both sort of had this moment in time where we were freeing up and we were like let's do it now before we get busy with other stuff. Being on the Darksiders projects, we were lucky as, as founders of the studio there to see it go from an idea, and an idea where should we, start a, should we start a studio? Hey, why don't we make a game? Let's go start a studio. Like the absolute genesis uh, of a game in a game studio. See, being there and experiencing all the ups and downs through, through to shipping multiple projects, it gives you the confidence to say, okay, there are certain Thing, there are certain challenges that you're going to have in game development that won't be insurmountable for us because we've done it. When uh, Vigil went down, I was one of the group that went uh, to form Crytek USA. Ryan and I had, you know, we were friends for like 10 years at that point, you know, since the early days of Vigil. And he told me that he was leaving and my first response was, okay, I'm coming. Like I was, you know, ready for something new and I basically forced myself, I was like, like, I'm coming with you guys, me and an animator. We were at Crytek USA together, and I was the first one to peel off, because Joe and I had said, okay, let's do this small thing. And it's like, okay, now's a good time, now's a good time to do it. We got together with Chris Brooks, who was kind of the final piece, bringing in the technology side. You know, at that time, they kind of had some ideas of what they wanted to do, but they didn't really have a programmer on board yet. So he kind of convinced me to come on board here and uh, to work with them. And um, actually at the time I wasn't sure if I wanted to get, you know, stick with games or do something else. 
Um, when I'd worked, I knew those guys so well and knew that they were really fun to work with and just that they were going to have an awesome, really cool, you know, vision of what they wanted to deliver. So um, ended up joining up with them. A lot of things aligned and it just felt like the time was right for us. The core of us, we're very comfortable with each other and I think that's one reason why we were able to start the company on solid ground is because we had that, you know, we had the people we knew we could bring in and trust. We had to go through um, some self-discovery very early on to say, okay, how small are we really? There was a point where we thought, what could we make with five people or six people? And I think we realized as our identity developed as a studio that we weren't going to be that small. And that wasn't really the game that suited us as developers or suited sort of the long-term vision. It was still developing, like what we imagined the studio would become. And we were very fortunate, even with our first round of sort of new blood hiring, the people we found were passionate, they were talented. And so it really wasn't hard to build the core of the team. At first we worked from home and coffee shops and stuff like that until we could get you know, enough money to, uh, to get an office. A lot of times we would get together on a Google Hangout to try and replicate the office experience somewhat. Even if we weren't necessarily talking, it was at any moment we could just turn over and look and say, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Uh, because we, I think we always in our mind knew that at some point we would be an office studio again. We never really aspired to be the type of studio where everybody worked from home. Uh, we always wanted to at some point get back together in the same room and, and really build a studio again. But yeah, the first three months were, there was definitely some of that <laughs> prototypical work in the coffee shop. We tried to hop around to different places to, to keep it fresh and to stay interested and motivated. The first studio was 300 square feet, so it was really small. We called it Grandma's House. It was way too small. The air conditioning was terrible in it. We first moved in, I think it was in, it was during the cooler months, I don't remember exactly when, so it felt fine, but then very quickly transitioned in the summer, and we had like a little fan that had a temperature readout on it, and it would routinely be, you know, 83, 84 degrees in the studio, which is, you know, hands sticking to the desk, like <laughs> lifting your arms up. It was, it was not, it was not fun. When I interviewed with them, it was funny because they, we did like a, you know, typically kind of, I was in Canada, they were down here, and so we did a Skype interview, and they were uh, doing kind of a video interview from within grandma's house, and I, I thought it was just like one of their apartments or something. Like, I, I didn't even know it was an office because they had like, there was like shelving in the background with like peanut butter and wine and open bag of potato chips or something, you know, like it was just very casual. And, uh, and so I knew I was getting into something different, but I mean, that was part of the appeal to me too, was, uh, you know, getting in on something small, uh, indie, you know, I think if you're somebody just starting, if your very first game job is going to be a startup, it's probably going to be hard. Um, now I think the benefit that we had when we were in sort of a similar situation at Vigil is you don't really know any better, so you're just going to go in with nothing but confidence and a lot of times that can lead you to success. And in our case, I think we had a good mix of enough of that confidence, but also the experience like, okay, Finishing the game or making a decent game is not going to be the challenge for us. Really what we're going to be learning now is that business development side of it. Because really at Vigil, the industry was completely different. There was one business model back then really, which was have a pitch, go to a publisher. It has to be a game that can go on store shelves and sell for 50 bucks or 60 bucks. Anything but that, you were like a, a you made budget PC titles which for which there was really no market. So the business plan was simple and very quickly we were acquired by THQ. So that kind of, <laughs> when that happened, a lot of the operational stuff for the studio moved to THQ and we just ex existed as a game studio. And the business development side of it was sort of taken out of the equation to, to some degree. Whereas when you stay independent, that never goes away. You know, it's that old Mike Tyson or whoever quote, I think ripped off from Sun Tzu where, you know, like no plan survives contact with the enemy or as Mike Tyson put it, you know, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And that's what the business side of starting a studio does for you, is that you may think you have a plan, and then when you go out there and you start doing sort of the dirty work, which is getting money to make your game, unless you're independently wealthy, <laughs> or you can go to Kickstarter and raise three million bucks, something that you know, makes it unnecessary to involve anybody else in your, in your development, the, you do start to see that there are certain, not rules you have to follow, but uh, your business plan has to adapt. You can't just say, under no circumstances are we going to change our identity. You have to let, especially in the, in the first year or two, when you're building, I guess, any company, I don't think this is exclusive to games at all, um, you have to be ready for your vision to adapt over the first few years of your company's existence.
When we started, Battle Chasers was not what we set out to make at all. I was very nervous about announcing a Battle Chasers game. I, just because, again, like as a creator, you just kind of want to move forward and like going back to something, especially something that's like almost, you know, 20 years old. It's like, I think, you know, because you don't know, like the market's different now. People are into different stuff. I just, I was worried that. And, and because the comic ended on a, a cliffhanger and it was unfinished, I thought that it was kind of like opening a can of worms potentially. You know, it would like give all the angry fans, like to kind of remind them like, oh yeah, I hate that guy. I forgot that my favorite comic just stopped in the middle of an issue. Um, so I, I, I worried about the reception of it, even despite the constant, you know, uh, like reminders and people asking over the years, I just felt like there was a good chance that it would not be well received. We had wanted to focus on new IPs and we went through a number of different, we, we actually discussed different game types. Very quickly we decided on either it was going to be a Metroidvania or it was going to be a turn-based RPG and we weren't sure which. I think the idea we took the furthest was that it was going to be some sort of fantasy game with not survival horror but uh, with a horror twist, more like Castlevania-esque in terms of, you know, vampires, werewolves, crazy creatures, a little, a little twist of darkness, but still pure, pure fantasy. But at some point we were sitting down with another one of our friends having lunch and one of the guys we were having lunch with said, well, you're doing a new studio and a new game. It's going to be Battle Chasers, right? I wasn't even sure if I'd ever get back to the comics. I mean, I wanted to, but each year that passed seemed more unlikely. It's like, mm, people are probably going to want to see something new versus you know, something that I did so long ago. And like my style was changing, the things I was into, it was just like, man, that was so long ago, let's do something new. You know, I was playing with the idea of a new fantasy world and as I started to do it, I was, I was kind of touching on certain things that already exist in the Battle Chasers universe and, um, you know, like magic and technology coexisting. And uh, it, it seemed like kind of a more, generic watered down version of what was already Battle Chasers and people already knew and missed these characters and it just they had like such nicely defined roles for like the kind of game we were making uh, because the the comic itself even back in the day was very influenced by RPGs that I was playing at the time so they all kind of already felt like cool game characters and uh, at some point we just realized that making it a Battle Chasers game was probably the better way to go rather than making something new that that felt similar to it. There was definitely that that defining moment where we were like, okay, yeah, let's do, let's make it Battle Chasers. So we had all the right ingredients to start working on a prototype and... Within a matter of like a couple of weeks we had a pretty basic prototype of the game going. We had you know, characters attacking and abilities happening and... It's like the ideal situation for an animator because the combat, because it's a fixed camera, you can basically cheat and do, you, the camera's controlled so you can, you can get stuff in quick and like it looks weird from the back but who cares, you're going to see it from the side and just make sure it looks cool so you can get through stuff quick and, uh, and just make it look cool for the camera and it's, you know, because it's fixed, uh, it's pretty easy to do. Building a game and a team at the same time is a challenge. But again, that's something we kind of knew. We were sort of prepared for that coming from Vigil, although it had been a long time. We were lucky as, as founders of the studio there to see it go from an idea, and an idea where should we start a, should we start a studio? Hey, why don't we make a game? Let's go start a studio. Like the absolute genesis uh, of a game in a game studio, see, being there and experiencing all the ups and downs through, through to shipping multiple projects. It gives you the confidence to say, okay, there are certain Thing, there are certain challenges that you're going to have in game development that won't be insurmountable for us because we've done it. We talked to some guys um, about Kickstarter stuff, like the Red Hook guys that did Darkest Dungeon, um, Keith Lee over at uh, Duelist, and they sort of had told us about the pros and cons of doing a Kickstarter, and that was seeming more and more to us like what course of action we, we would probably take. We got a small um, investment that we knew would be all the money that it would take for us to go to Kickstarter with something that wasn't smoke and mirrors. 
We wanted it to be a real game when we went to Kickstarter. That was something that was very important to us. And it was. All of those dungeon rooms, the characters, the combat abilities, everything that we showed in Kickstarter, um, with, the ex with the exception of maybe some you know, special effects or, or sound effects, uh, they're in the final game. But when we started working on the game, initially it was all driven by the gameplay because we knew that it would be a pretty easy process of putting the characters and the world onto the gameplay. So we just started asking ourselves, what do we really want combat to feel like? You know, I would talk to Joe and like, you know, Ryan and like we would, very collaborative process like, hey, you know, what do you think about this and working together and uh, especially with the, the heroes like, hey, you know, I want to make Calibretto heal. He, had, he didn't heal anyone in the comics, but uh, you know, he would fit this role nicely with his connection with nature and he's a war golem. He's got this magic coursing through him and other than that it was just like it needs to feel good and, and, uh, and look cool. Early on we played with all kinds of ideas to, to make the combat feel unique. I, we had like a card system where you got like equipped cards and uh, we had like a more of an active battle system where you know the, the creatures didn't wait for you to, to take the turn but we realized that when you played it, you started to like really act quickly and you didn't even really have time to read what each ability did. And, and because we knew we wanted uh, the strategy in the combat to be pretty deep, we, we needed people to be able to just stop and really plan the strategy and how certain abilities work with others. Uh, and when you, when you, the cool thing about an active system is that it puts pressure on you and you always have this tension of acting quickly. But, but when you're doing that, it counteracts like any strategy that you might have, especially when you're getting new abilities throughout the game and you haven't really had a chance to figure out how that's gonna work with the stuff that you had before. I don't think we ever questioned how Battle Chasers would work as a turn-based RPG. It just seemed like a natural fit, so we never thought, how are we gonna do this? Because there were a number of different ways we could approach it. We could make a game that was, if it was gonna be single player, were we gonna have to choose just one of the many heroes to play? That would have been a very difficult difficult decision. In a way, probably more difficult than which horsemen were we gonna choose for Darksiders. Picking one Battle Chasers character to focus on would have been tough. Well, guess what? You don't need to do that if you're a turn-based RPG. So when we decided it was Battle Chasers, I think those two pieces just clicked immediately into place. I think for most of the people on the team, uh, this was the first time that we had done a turn-based game. So it was, it was definitely a new experience developing one, though we all were fans of the genre and we all had lots of experience playing them. So we kind of just took what, you know, like took, like what are the takeaways from these, like our favorite games and what is done well and what could possibly be updated from you know, some of the older combat systems that maybe were really awesome but would feel kind of grindy or outdated now. The combat screen was almost like, as soon as we, we had a screen mock from Joe of how it was gonna look, we were like, okay, we know how combat's gonna work and feel. Rather than just doing your basic attacks for 80 to 90% of, of the fights until you got to the boss fight, you know, conserving all your mana, do basic attack, and use potions when you're about to die. Wait till you get to the boss fight and then load all your mana in you know a handful of damage or healing spells. We wanted to play more like a true strategy game where okay you're using the full breadth of your abilities in most of the encounters rather than a few of them. And actually the dungeons were probably the two things that went through the, the most conceptual iteration. The original design was for you to do dungeons a lot, like you were going to be able to run the same dungeon maybe 10 times. The randomized dungeons were going to allow people to play like in a slightly different order or just like repeat the same dungeon over and over again. And They could potentially, you know, do things in an order that's different than you planned them. I think pe some people might have been expecting something a little more narrative driven, like, like a the old school JRPGs where you like wake up in bed and you talk to your mom and then your village gets attacked. There is a part of me that wishes we kind of had done that, but just the structure of our game was different. It really was more of a dungeon crawler than a typical RPG, so we had to sort of handle the story a little differently. The very first concept for the dungeon was actually looking at a top-down like D&D map and all you saw was an icon moving around and there, were, there would be text pop-ups that would describe what was happening to you, almost like a dungeon master were speaking to you and you wouldn't, see, you wouldn't really see any animation. This was the indie version of, of Battle Chasers, and then when you came into contact with an enemy or were ambushed, it would go to the gorgeous you know, Final Fantasy three style uh, or four style combat screen. And we're like, now we're not satisfied with that. We, you know, it's too big, 
of a leap going between those. So then we had a version of the dungeons that were 2D, so they actually looked more like uh, if you were to take Final Fantasy IV, VI and IV's dungeon screens, or even Fantasy Star II's dungeon screens, and, and put Joe Mad art over them, that's how they would look. And so we had a, a gameplay prototype of a, of a 3D character running around in a you know straight, not isometric angle, but just a straight on 2D dungeon running around through the dungeon. And that started to show some promise. And then we made the mistake of just doing a test, since we had a 3D character already, of what it would look like running around in a 3D dungeon. And as soon as we saw that, it was like, yep, no going back. We committed to the, the fully 3D dungeons. At the beginning of the project, um, when I started helping the project out, I wasn't full-time yet. I um, looked through some of, the, some of the comic backgrounds. What's cool about the comic backgrounds is they're fully open, so there's a, a lot of interpretation we can do. So we just started out with uh, some sketches and uh, kind of just went a, a bit blue sky. We'd get concepts and they kind of get uh, worked on back and forth between uh, Grace, Jesse, and Joe. And you kind of see these like rough sketches become these fully rendered concepts and then it transfer into this like fully built dungeon. And Pretty much every environment, we were always kind of all hands on deck. Uh, everybody had to wear a lot of different hats. Um, that's really kind of a cool thing about working on a small team is that you're very involved with uh, all of the stuff that's going on in the creation of the environments. Early on, I made dungeons with a lot of room options, so a lot of things would change when you returned uh, back to the room because we expected that you're going to see this room over and over and over again. So we try to make it as interesting as possible by changing the layouts and certain things that happen in the room. And then as we started playing the game, we made a, a five-room dungeon uh, for a demo and it took about half an hour to play. And then we're like, oh, that's a, a lot longer than our predictions. So we ended up realizing that now you're not gonna run the same dungeon as many times as we thought. On the other hand, the world map, which was originally a fully explorable 2D space, well, we started to think some, something had to give if we wanted to keep the team at a modest size. So at one point, the world map was actually cut completely, and it was just going to be picking dungeons from a list in a, a simple town that you could click on buildings and click on NPCs, and dungeons might be depicted as either a list or images somewhere that you would go in and just rerun before we kind of compromised with the map that was, well then it was actually gonna be node based and you actually would move down the nodes and at each node something would happen. And so through this <laughs> organic process, we decided on what it would eventually be, which would be constrained down paths, branching paths, a town that you could actually walk from building to building in. You'd see the dungeons, you'd use the map to find secrets. And when we took that pre-production work and slapped the Battle Chasers characters onto it, it was like, it's perfect. We were terrified going to Kickstarter. Um, again, it was just a great unknown. And we had seen a lot of, well, the one thing that gave me some confidence is that I had a hard time finding Kickstarter pages and projects that looked awesome, that just fell on their face. You know, there were some examples of games that were borderline that didn't make it, or actually, I take that back. There were some really cool, truly indie looking games that didn't make it on Kickstarter that even today I'm confused as to why they didn't get funded because they just looked awesome. Um, but I think we believe that because we had sort of a backstory, the whole Vigil and Darksiders thing was still relatively fresh and people were still curious where those developers had gone. And obviously having Joe who was so closely tied to Darksiders. And like, you know, like we said, some people just remember his work in the games that, and, and projects that he's involved in, both Battle Chasers and Darksiders. We felt pretty confident that we would go there and we would at least hit sort of our minimum our minimum goals. We didn't know necessarily if, the big question was, okay, are we going to get big? Are we gonna be like a million plus? Which we'd hoped for, sure. Um, but we felt like we would hit, we, we would get the money that we needed to survive and make the game. After we announced that we were doing Battle Chasers and people were like excited about it, uh, and not angry like I feared. I, I, I definitely got more excited about it and I started to do sketches for how I might update some of the characters' designs and stuff like that. And it was so cool like working on these characters again. Like I don't think I even realized how much I missed doing it until I actually started. Uh, and then just the idea of seeing them in 3D running around. And yeah, I mean, I think everyone got really excited about it. But the most interesting challenge was saying, okay, we're gonna show this game at you know, 
20% of its development timeline rather than 80% of its development timeline. It has to look good then because you have to sell the concept to the fans. So whereas a lot of games tend to not really look great until 50 to 70% of the way through, we had to have something that worked, sort of stuck to the idea of the pre-production timeline so that you're doing solid due diligence on the game before you move into full production, basically so you don't do wasted work. A game has to look good, but it has to stay early and it has to be ready to go into full production. And then you're <laughs> to stay true to that to the commitment to the Kickstarter fans, you're showing some of that development process through the entire course of making the game. That was a big was a big change. The first day of the Kickstarter, I, I would even say like the days leading up to it, but that first day when we went live, everyone was just we were just at our computers hitting refresh and just like watching the numbers and freaking out. Like it was one of the most exhilarating and just nerve wracking moments ever. And when we hit, I think within the second or third day we hit our goal and we were like, oh, thank God. Uh, I remember I, like, I kept taking uh, screen captures of like the, the funds as they kept going like throughout the day. And uh, I was actually at my previous job while that was still going down. So that was, it was really exciting to like be there and then also seeing this other project I worked on and like seeing it just like blossom essentially. It was like, wow, this is really happening. This is crazy. That moment where we hit the funding goal and we, we knew that it was going to happen, it was like, we all just like cheered and hugged each other. It was definitely a, an awesome moment. But I think we were all a little surprised at just the size of the reaction, just given that it had been 15 or so years since a Battle Chasers comic issue had come out. But even though you know, Battle Chasers came out 15 years ago and Darksiders 2 came out five years ago, people still care about both. Definitely whenever I would do like comic book shows uh, and signings, like the, the Battle Chasers fans would come out. One guy gave me this like Save the War Golems t-shirt with a like, calibretto on it and stuff. It was really cool. Whatever project we were talking about, there'd always be some like but when are you finishing Battle Chasers? That is one of the things that I think speaks to Joe and his legacy is that he makes things that people remember, they care about in ways that maybe you don't expect when you're creating it, but then you learn over time that it, they don't get forgotten. They have some sort of staying power. The first time, I think it was either E3 or PAX, just having a, a backer actually play the game and be super into it, and just everyone that saw it loved it. And it was like, hey, like, this is cool because people are liking it. We didn't waste, like, you know, two years of our lives. You I know, mean, I'm confident we can make an awesome game, but you're still working on something, and then you kind of have to be like, oh, please like it. And then, you know, the fact that we've had such a positive response and uh, the Kickstarter community, all of the fans have been, like, we have, like, the best fan base. Everyone is so cool. Um, the internet can get very um, ugly, but, like, our fans have just been awesome like the whole time. Our Kickstarter backers have been awesome. I mean, we we would run into them at shows, we'd be at PAX or whatever, people would come up to play the game and we'd be telling them all about it and they'd be like, I know, I'm already a backer, I just wanted to play it. And they always were like, hey, it's way cooler than I thought it would be or I'm so glad I backed this, it's the game I'm most excited about this year, whatever. It's always nice to get praise from anyone that sees your game, but when it's like a backer that sort of took that chance and gave you their money, put some faith in you, it's nice to hear that they are excited about it. I'm pretty sure that without Kickstarter, uh, we probably wouldn't have been able to pull it off. You know, I think uh, if, if, if people are ever wondering like, will this game happen without, it's, people are they're gonna make it anyway, I don't need to like uh, back this thing. Uh, in our case, I can honestly say that probably would not have happened because we we got interest from publishers after we had we had tried to meet with publishers like all throughout development, uh, and people were like, "Yeah, it looks cool. We're kind of into it." But it wasn't until after the hype that we got on Kickstarter and and our ability to make a playable prototype uh, and hire more people that you know we we our, our playable suddenly became really polished and really nice looking and we had happened to get in touch with uh, nordic at the time now thq nordic uh, they reached out to some of us sort of informally at the time they acquired the darksiders ip 
And we had kind of talked to them about Battle Chasers before Kickstarter already, just because, again, we had a relationship with them, so we talked to some of the people we already knew. And uh, it was after the Kickstarter campaign when we said, okay, let's bring on somebody else so we can make something a little bit bigger. We met with them, and they were immediately interested in going even beyond what we had planned and doing things like putting out a physical release for the game and, and increasing the scope and you know, giving us the resources to do things like uh, we already had a composer, Clark Powell, who's making awesome music for the game. Okay, let's you know let, let's supplement that with a guy like Jesper Kidd and bring on a few more contractors and really kind of make the game something that could straddle the line between, I guess, indie or independent and AAA. One of the jokes some of our you know truly indie studio friends that we made was that the game was more like triple I, not triple A, but not indie. It's it's triple I. At that point, all the pieces were in place, and we just more or less finished the game. When a lot of the systems were starting to come online and come, come all together, and we were making a big push to make the first dungeon, the Iron Outpost, feel really cool. And so what we would do is we would, uh, every department would go um, and work on something for a whole week, and then on Friday, we would all get together, we'd make a build, we put on the big TV, and then all play it and see each other's work and everything. So this is the time when uh, we first got some of our uh, scripting systems in place and some of our UI things, so I really had a lot more to play with as a designer. And then we were playing the dungeon and someone got to the, uh, the scripted event that I made and they got to this fountain where this, uh, you were asked a riddle. And the whole team read the riddle and someone was like, oh, the answer is A. And then someone said, no, the answer is B. And so they were like debating and you know, talking about it. And then they, they chose an answer and it was the correct one and the gate lowered and then they got the treasure chest and then everyone kind of like, you know, clapped and like they were exclaiming, they were really happy. And no joke, someone sitting next to me turned around and gave me a high five. So and it was just, a, it seems like a really simple thing, but it was like really when the, we were, the game was coming together and really felt that like we were making something really cool and fun that we would like to play. We definitely take really seriously the games that we make. You know, everybody here has really large passion to make excellent games, both in, in terms of the, the content, the gameplay, uh, all parts of it are really taken seriously, but at the same time, as a group of people, we don't take ourselves too seriously. We, we have a really good time doing the stuff that we do, and I think that culture uh, in video game studios is definitely a, it's a unique thing from one studio to another, and every studio I've worked at has had things that I liked about it, but um, being here at Airship, um, there's definitely a, a camaraderie and a, a, a cool um, ethos and, and a culture here that, that really makes you feel at home, and uh, that's, that's a really great place to be. A group of game developers is a group of passionate people, you know. So, look, you're you're going to be dealing with strong opinions, and you're going to be dealing with differing opinions. And it's, you know, we're in a small studio. We ended up with a lot of people in a small space, and um, I think it's it's a testament to the team, though, that we came out of it the way the way we did, as you know, friends and colleagues and coworkers who respect one another. So, it was tough. Most good games that come out go through a difficult development cycle. There aren't many that are really, really good or are remarkable and were smooth sailing. I think those are few and far between. It's been basically my dream job to be involved, you know, from the beginning on a, not just the project, but like seeing the company form up, going through like 700 names, trying to pick out a name and just being there from step one. It's, I've always, um, I always talked about, uh, Myself, like I, w I don't think I would want to work on like a feature film or anything. I always saw myself as a game developer before animator. Like I just love making games. That's like my hobby and what I like to do. So, being there from the beginning and just, uh, you know, being part of the whole process has been uh, been really awesome. Airship is a really fun place to work. It's it's got a great team, and it it has been really fun working on a small, relatively small project and being able to feel like we can have a real big influence on everything that's happening. I mean, Ryan and, and I were both uh, co-founders of Vigil, so we definitely had, we started that with four people too, and even though it grew to over 200 people, uh, we were there from the very beginning. So it wasn't really new to us, um, but we definitely, trying to stay indie and do it on our own for as long as possible, um, that was pretty new. I mean, THQ acquired us very early on uh, at Vigil, and so we were, you know, working on Darksiders as employees of 
a large publisher, and you know that is not the case this time around. We are still an independent company, and, and uh, even though we had a publisher for Battle Chasers, we are not owned by anyone, so we're still you know just running things on our own, and that that is new. Battle Chasers was important because it was sort of the playground we used to discover ourselves as a studio, and that was when we realized, I think, okay, we want to make games that you can make with, you know, 12 people, 15 people, and do in a couple of years, and sort of make these, I don't know what you would call them, mid-tier, but really high quality uh, gaming experiences. Not the AAA, you know, huge budget, 40 plus people type games, but what can 15 people do with, you know, with a, with a decent budget and a decent time frame. And that's really what we've become now, and I think that's what we're going to be for the foreseeable future. Naming things is always, <laughs> it's fun. It's fun, especially at first, and then you realize none of them are good and it's gonna take forever and you just start to get frustrated and annoyed. I think we had multiple official names for the studio. Let's see. Um, one of the first was Retrograde. We liked that name. I think one of the ones that uh, I liked that we were gonna go with was uh, Boss Door, or I think, but then like Boss Key came out like a day after. So then we went through another round of names, and you're talking text message exchanges, Google Docs that are, you know, pages and pages long of just names. What were some of them? Dead Pixel, Mad Lion, that was my suggestion, Joe never liked it. We eventually came on one that caught on enough where we had a logo, which was Chaotic Evil, which is kind of cool, right? Like D&D ties and RPGs and Joe actually went so far as to buy the domain name for Chaotic Evil and we had chaoticevil.com, we put a logo up there, it was just a logo so it was totally mysterious, you wouldn't have known what it was. Then we started going to the website from certain public spaces like coffee shops and we would sometimes find the domain name blocked. I'm like, I wasn't even sure what that was the first time it happened. So we started looking into these domain services, you know, these domain name services that would block domains based on objectionable content. And when we researched further and started actually contacting them, they said, yeah, this was, uh, this was a porn site in the past. <laughs> and so then we, again, went through this iteration process, like names, names, names. The name Airship really stuck because of the obvious ties to RPGs. You know, I mean, as soon as we said it and knowing the game we were making off the bat was a turn-based RPG that to evoke the classics, especially the Final Fantasy games with their very notorious airships. We, uh, like, that's it. Let's just make it work. I think uh, Airship was definitely my favorite, like, as soon as it came up, because it evokes that, you know, old school RPG. You always have airships. And, uh, so I'm happy that we missed out on Chaotic Evil and, and uh, Retrograde and all those other ones. And then it was a question of Airship Games, Airship Studios, Airship whatever. Somehow we threw out the name Syndicate and it got kind of, the, the, to imply that there's this sort of manufacturing process associated with or this group of you know, uh, companies contributing to, to airships, you know, which is what a syndicate is, it, felt, it just felt cool. So it's kind of a mouthful when you're saying it, Airship Syndicate, so we just call ourselves Airship, but it looks pretty awesome on the logo. So, so we have a, we put a time sprayer in the bathroom that sprayed, you know, the air fresher. Psst. And it would like kind of startle me in the bathroom sometimes because I would forget it was there. And I was like, how cool would it be if it was just like sitting behind someone's monitor and it just like sprayed like out of nowhere while they were working. And uh, I didn't realize that I had it, it. I put it between Ryan's two monitors so that he couldn't see it. But somehow the spray like went right through the gap like perfectly and sprayed him in the face so uh, that, that was kind of cool i was look I, at that moment there was something that i was like what is that i was leaning into my monitor to look something i went <laughs> <laughs> and it sprayed right in the face with like patchouli or something you know we always have a lot of fun around the studio you know from whether it's jeff goldblum's picture hanging out in the bathroom watching you go or, you know, just the various pranks we'll play on each other. I do occasionally try to, like, make little traps. Really? I thought that would work. 
Are you yeah. filming this? Right yes, I am. Because <laughs> what are you talking about? Look at the one that's still up there. Damn it! Happen. Evasion. <laughs> you guys are terrible. Plus at one. <laughs> We have had some pretty raucous Nerf Wars. Uh, we have one bathroom, and it was not uncommon to open the bathroom door and see all eight or nine other studio members standing there with Nerf guns aimed at the door. 